All right, I think we're gonna get started. Good morning, my name is Megan. I'm one of the Medicine Chief Residents. And today it's my pleasure to introduce today's Grand Round speaker, Dr. Andrew Auerbach. Dr. Auerbach is a professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine in the Division of Hospital Medicine. He is a widely recognized leader in hospital medicine and leads a 50 hospital research network fo focused on innovations in inpatient care models and reduction of diagnostic errors. Dr. Auerbach serves as a hospital medicine section editor for Up to Date, a chapter author for Cecil's Textbook of Medicine, and is the past editor in chief of the Journal of Hospital Medicine. He has mentored dozens of students, residents, fellows, and junior faculty. Dr. Auerbach's research has been published in prominent journals, including the New England Journal of Medicine, um, Annals of Internal Medicine, JAMA, and Archives of Internal Medicine. He has received the Mac Lipkin Award for Outstanding Research as a Fellow and the Western Society for Clinical Investigation Outstanding Investigator Award, and is a member of the American Society for Clinical Investigation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Auerbach. Great, well, it's nice to be back on the East Coast. Uh, and thanks for the invitation to join you today. Um, just to start some disclosures of my funding sources and the company that I founded, which is worth exactly $42. So <laughs> there's no particular conflict of interest there. Um, a play in three acts, no one dies in the third act, but first off, I just uh, jump in the way back machine, just kind of give you some context about where diagnostic errors, diagnostic safety comes from. Uh, talk about some of the work we've been doing with people here and across the country uh, about how to measure diagnostic errors, diagnostic processes. And, and then we're gonna talk about some of the work, again, doing with people here, uh, the solutions we're starting to think about to improve our ability to make an accurate, timely, equitable diagnosis. So this is the Wayback Machine, if you remember this cartoon a million years ago. So we're gonna enter the Wayback Machine. Most of you weren't alive, some of your attendings were. And when this paper came out, right? This is um, probably one of the most important papers in, in healthcare delivery of the last 50 years. This is the Harvard Medical Practice Study where they looked at charts of about 3,000 people who had a trigger event. And uh, that trigger events looked like this, things you probably recognize. Um, and then they found, a, they did chart reviews. This is pretty groundbreaking. They had two physicians, sometimes three, look at every record to see if an error or safety event took place. And you'll notice that the number one on the list there is the drug-related errors. That was where all the issues on, we'll talk about all the interventions, but like that's why drug safety has been such a prominent part of our lives as internists for the last 30 years. But you'll notice what number two is there, diagnostic mishaps. Drug errors, that, because it's not easy, but it was something we could kind of pick off. It's also the most biggest problem cut both across internal medicine patients and procedural patients became the real, the big focus. And we did, there were lots and lots of trials went on, lots of different interventions, so many interventions, we had meta-analysis. I know this slide shows meta-analysis of meta-analyses. So we, were, we got deep into this understanding of what produces medication errors. And that led to a bunch of stuff. You probably recognize these things around you in the wards. Uh, you, obviously, the EHR, everyone's mind goes to Epic, says, you know, the EHR fixes this, gives us like standard buttons. You can't, there's no handwriting problems anymore. Um, you have changes of the human technology interface. So probably the, 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 most, the most important thing we've done in the technology for med safety is barcode med, med administration, get the right drug to the right patient at the right time. So it isn't just the technology, it's how we work with technology. Um, reference standard databases, like behind all the drug dose checking in there, there's a bunch of databases that have figured this out. And as we move to the genomic era, it's gonna be even more complicated and driven by databases. And then changes in teams, really big. Again, it's probably the second most important thing we've done to improve medication safety. As we've been in the ICU recently, a pharmacist on rounds, key part of how we deliver better care from a medication safety standpoint. And all this is stitched together with a bunch of policies, procedures, standards, uh, legislation, you know, some of these are never events. So there's a, both internal things to this hospital and external forces that make us focus on drug errors. So the safety is essentially, doing that, all that work is start off with measurement though, right? You had to do that first study to figure out how often the problem was happening and where it was happening. But let's just start with a case, because thinking about that, measuring a diagnosis, is always easier for me to think about a case. This is actually a real one we did a while ago. A 70 year old woman who had chronic heart failure. She had hysteroscopy for uterine mass. Uh, it was complicated by uterine perforation. So 
they, when they're doing the hysteroscopy, they do lavage of the uterus, more fluid went in than came back out, which for them is a kind of sign of uterine perforation. It's a reasonably common complication. Um, so she gets admitted afterwards with mild hypoxemia, gets to medicine. Of course, it's five o'clock. It's probably a, a Friday, we'll guess. We'll make this. So this is, comes to medicine because uh, OB doesn't have their, or GYN doesn't have their own inpatient service. And also this is a, a medicine complication. But when she comes over for hypoxemia, her biggest problem is actually abdominal pain. So at 10 a.m. the next day, uh, she gets hypotense, her lactate is up, um, medication begins administering uh, antibiotics, some IV fluids, uh, obstetrics, or GYN sorry, takes a look at her and says, this still feels like aspiration to us. This is just, you know, it didn't look like a complication during the procedure. Uh, pr continue the course with fluids and antibiotics. Um, that does his work. By 2 p.m., she's off to the ICU for shock. Uh, general surgery is called around four, like a different set of eyes sees her at this point. Also, that she's gotten a lot worse. So general surgery sees her. Uh, at that 6 p.m., the CT scan is done. Uh, and then she goes to the OR, where they found a small bowel perforation and ischemia due to the pressors that she was on. And unfortunately, she suffered a PA arrest and couldn't be resuscitated at 3 a.m. the next morning. So, kind of, not, not a rhetorical question, was this a good diagnostic process? If you kind of thought about this the next morning as the attending or the resident on the team, was this like, could this have gone better is kind of a fundamental question. Could this diagnosis have been made more accurately sooner? Um, and, but how would you even know? Like, how would you measure that? If you had like explained that to your colleague, how would you kind of measure that? So schematic, schematics are always good for me. So start off with the symptom or sign, classic diagnostic process. You start off with the symptom or sign, some history. Uh, you talk to the patient, of course, spend some time with the patient. Uh, you have your team. Uh, you go to the records, you do some research, you maybe look at Epic. Uh, you do some deep thinking. Hopefully you've got some op opportunity to do some cognitive work to kind of synthesize all of this information. And then you come up with a timely and accurate diagnosis. Timeliness and accurate, keep those two things because they're kind of like two vectors on this we're trying to measure. So, uh, and then the world of diagnostic error, there's this idea of the diagnostic opportunity. This, you may hear this elsewhere. I don't use this very often, but you may hear elsewhere. That that's the gap between timely and accurate and what it ended up being. So like, what was the kind of opportunity you had to make a better diagnosis? Often though, you start off, uh, you, the clock goes off, you have a delayed diagnosis, right? So this is where you start off with like uh, a misdiagnosis ends up being correct diagnosis. I'll give you an example. This is like, you start off with chronic heart failure and it turns out to be aortic stenosis. Like you're working with like, this is chronic, uh, hef, hef, uh, hef, ref, whatever, you want to, whatever work diagnosis was, we actually realized you missed AS in the middle of all this. You make the diagnosis, but it happens too late. I think this example is more what you think of with a, a diagnostic error. This is when you start off with diagnosis A and like, oh my God, on pathology, diagnosis B comes up, right? This is the missed diagnosis. So I'm just trying to give you some more lexicon, misdiagnosis versus missed diagnosis. Sometimes you make those mixed up. So that's when you start off with like BPA, B, 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 B in the um, ED, like person comes in with dizziness, give them some meclizine, send them home, they come up with a, a retrieval stroke the next day. Like that's a missed diagnosis, a kind of a classic one. So, so like if only the world was this simple, right? So often it looks like this, right? None of our patients have just one thing. They've got a multiple things. They've got, you're working on multiple different possibilities. I used to joke UCSF as like an all of the above differential diagnosis. They probably have a little bit of everything. Uh, so you're kind of going all over the place. And at the end, you get this kind of, I guess it's Schrodinger's cat. You're kind of a recovering PCAM person. So like, you, know, you don't ever know exactly what's going on often at the end of an encounter. You've got a few working diagnoses that one of them or two of them is more likely than the others. That's where your, your emphasis is going to be. And that's kind of where the challenge of measuring diagnosis is. And this is a little pointy-headed, but it's important because this is the foundation of the work we're going to do together to improve diagnostic excellence. So how do we measure diagnostic errors? There are, there are kind of four big phenotypes here. So autopsies, you, this is a classic way to do it you know, the kind of unsuspected cancer or the dissection that was seen on autopsy. Uh, uh, they're not too easy to get. Our autopsies are not common any longer. But if you see those diagnoses, the missed diagnosis, the unsuspected, that's a pretty, uh, pretty valid outcome, right? People say, oh, geez, yeah, that's definitely a miss there. Um, you don't usually end up at the end with like, oh, and you should have done this test to diagnose it. Uh, these days, we've done so, many, so much axial 
scanning, there's so many biopsies, serologies, like if an unsuspected result is often kind of like happens despite all that happening. So you don't often get an actionable process. Um, the example I gave you a minute ago with vertigo being, then being a stroke is kind of the symptom diagnosis dis disconnect. That's another way people have done it using administrative data. They'll go and look at the problem list for encounter A and look at the problem list from encounter B in Epic and say, why are these so different? So pretty easy to do if you can get the data to line up, right? Um, it's, if you pick the right diagnoses, that one I keep coming back to is a pretty recognizable one. You all would kind of agree like that something is wrong there. Um, so if the algorithm is kind of reasonable, you can get a lot of face value out of it. But it ends, ends up being very system focused, right? Um, another example which is emerging is like the stage at presentation. This is uh, increasingly important for cancer diagnoses. So the proportion of which your system um, sees patients with late stage cancer who are already in your system is a sign of a diagnostic process. Now you can say, well, that's probably because doctors maybe not thinking about it, it could also be your system's not working well. So that's the tension that arises with that one. But again, another way we've begun to start measuring uh, a diagnostic opportunity. And then there's the chart-based method, which has been viewed as the gold standard in patient safety, but is not at all easy. Uh, people who are doing the depth study here will know to say this right now, but it's really valid. Like you can get in there and really dig into the chart and figure out what, uh, what happened as best you can. And at the end, you get much more about the provider. And I think that's the gap that our studies have been trying to fill. What is the provider's role in addition to the, the system in making diagnosis better? If you, it depends on how you look, though. If you look at across these range of methods, you get a range of outcomes race. So that goes from like less than one percent if you kind of pool safety studies and look for how they measure diagnostic errors. So which you think that's way too low. Autopsies put an undercount and selective, but you can see this. It kind of gets, comes down to like if you look harder, you will find them. This kind of ends up being the rule. There's also a little bit of uh, kind of which population you're looking into. So an undifferentiated general population of medical patients may you may see fewer. Errors, you may see the same number of process opportunities, but you may see fewer actual missed diagnoses. And as you get to these trigger events, like we were studying, you see more often you can see actual diagnostic misses or, missed or delays. So this is what we did in a study that was published earlier this year. Uh, we put a company called Visient to, to take a bunch of data during the 2019, so immediately before the pandemic, calendar year, all the patients admitted with medical diagnoses at um, 30 hospitals involved with the home run network I mentioned a minute ago. Uh, we we're looking at the 25,000 or so that died or went to the ICU. Um, we randomly selected about 4,000 of those, screened those to see if they had been sent to the ICU out of a protocol or actually never been on medicine. Some people are assigned to medicine like at the very end, so you, you'd never see this, I'm sure. Um, and then we did 2,428 chart reviews. So we asked each of these cases, we used a tool called the Safer DX to see if a diagnostic error happened. We looked to see if the diagnostic error caused harm. So you can think about frameworks for that. And then of 50 possible diagnostic processes, what went wrong? So let's think about that woman who we talked about a minute ago, 17 year old hysteroscopy ends up dying of perforated bowel and intra-abdominal sepsis. Do you, Raise your hands, did a diagnostic error happen? And again, use the definition, uh, correct or timely diagnosis. Anybody think uh, there was a diagnostic error in that case? A lot of, a lot of, hand, a lot of hands up, great. Um, you got a job. So uh, we thought so too, right? So the clinical case should have prompted consideration of earlier. Remember she came over for hypoxia, but she was complaining of abdominal pain, which again, could be true, true and related, but worth additional thoughts. Um, her lactate in the first morning is not at all consistent with what her pulmonary status was. So you could have thought about it different, differently. Uh, we talked about history suggesting an alternate diagnosis. Uh, we thought that the exam misinterpreted was a big, again, these are the, the think about those 50 fields. These are some check boxes on those 50 fields. So the exam was probably misinterpreted. Uh, the CT probably should have happened a little earlier, certainly in the morning when she was getting septic. I think that was the point we thought the most, the, kind of the most a reasonable and prudent physician would have said, well, maybe we should image the abdomen now that things are going a little weird. Um, or you see a very recognized urgent condition, referral to surgery. There was this interesting subtext in the notes. The gynecologists were like, this feels like a reasonable complication to us. And the internist was like, we don't think so, but we trust you. 
which is totally, this happens all the time, but like that, that spidey sense you can see was kind of in the team's head. And then kind of overweighing this lower likelihood diagnosis again. And if you think about it, this is a mix of like team performance, communication, and how we think as physicians kind of features. So um, getting these out of the medical records is a little bit challenging. We spent a whole other hour or three talking about how we train people to do this, but this, we have a whole kind of legal jargon kind of um, that we use to kind of figure out what a note means um, to get these points. And then here's an example of what the, um, the, the case reviewers wrote in this case. All right, so do that 2,427 more times. That's what we did for this first study, about half hour, 45 minutes per case. Very hard to do at scale, but very important to get this kind of initial cut at the kind of the physician practice that study, Harvard Medical Practice study, kind of sense of what this problem looks like. Uh, so 23% of the cases had diagnostic error, uh, caused temporary or permanent harm or death in 18%. So temporary harm is like needed to stay uh, a day longer on oxygen with a pulse ox monitoring. Um, permanent harm, but obviously you need a surgery or a line that left a scar or something like that. And then death kind of in this case is pretty uh, kind of easy to kind of explain, if not uh, easy to interpret sometimes. Um, in all the deaths in our cohorts, so about 1,800, uh, so about 1,200 deaths, we had 7% uh, of those, the error led to the death. So pretty high error uh, to death ratio. And if you look at the contributors, kind of top to bottom, then we, we rolled those 50 domain, individual questions into nine domains. So access presentation, like did the patient not come to the hospital? Could they get out to the hospital in the right time? Is it, is it where that comes from? You can kind of intuit the rest of these. So the most common ones um, were errors in history taking, uh, access presentation faults, errors in assessment. So if you look at the prevalence, just raw numbers, those are the most common problems we saw. Um, if you look at the odds, then you have to kind of like take the prevalence and the risk of an error into account. That's where odds come into play. Uh, you get uh, the, the, the risk kind of, the list kind of rejiggers a little bit. So you you get um, testing problems kind of jump up to the top. So the highest rate of errors in, or highest odds ratio for errors were in the testing group. Um, teamwork jumps up, again, rare, but a high rate of di diagnostic errors in those, and also uh, assessment. So what we do to kind of pull all these data together to synthesize and make a decision were um, the odds, the third highest odds. And I point to that because if you, what this can do to you is kind of you can focus attention on a really high odds ratio but a rare com problem here. So you can then take these two together and com combine them into this thing called an attribute, uh, population attributable risk or a risk reduction ratio. So if you took all your energy and put it into um, errors in assessment, you reduce your diagnostic error rate by 24%. And that's what this number means. So if you had to, again, if you're thinking about prioritizing your efforts, it comes down to errors in assessment and errors in testing, kind of the top two things you could think about. And errors in testing were like, not like you didn't follow up on it, but just not choosing the right test in the first place. So think about these as the opportunities to improve diagnoses. All right, so let's move to sort of some solutions. So we took the upside model and uh, have gotten additional funding to look at 14 sites that were originally part of upside plus some new friends like ones here at Mount Sinai to take that review process and kind of bake it into existing safety and uh, quality programs at our sites. Try to add our adjudication team's efforts to what we're already doing to look at bedfalls or incident reports and just get these data into the hands of people who already know, we hope know, what to do with safety problems. And we're, instead of just focusing on ICU transfers and deaths like we did in Upside, we're also including rapid response team calls. So we thought, as we're looking at the Upside cases, a lot of those were preceded by one or more RT calls. We call them RTs, probably call them medical emergency teams, or they're called, so good. So moving the kind of lens a little further out to capture people earlier and earlier before they actually go to the ICU. And then we said, well, knowledge is power. Let's get the data out to people who need the, the data. So we're going to get data about uh, each site, what they're doing. Um, so get the teams, our, our teams integrated into the QI programs, the safety programs, but also give them data from our reviews, like they do for bedfalls, or insert reports. So Mount Sinai knows its own data. But also let Mount Sinai, Sinai compare itself to the other 13 sites in the ADEPT network, which is another, a classic way to compel or kind of catalyze collaboration and change. We've, the surgeons have done this for years, ICUs have done this for years, kind of benchmarking is kind of 
in an era where no one wants to be behind Harvard, get beyond the same dashboard as Brigham is pretty motivating to our CMIO, CMO. And to take those data, because like, you know, I gave you a hint at a minute ago, like if you look at the population attributable risk, those fractions where you should focus your efforts, like once you start to know where your problems are, you can start to figure out what your program should look like. Because there's a sense right now, just do everything, which in a time where we don't have enough money or time as it is, like that's just not the right answer. So can you pick some or tailor your current programs that you're focusing on testing specifically or figuring out ways to help with assessment? So that's kind of the overall idea of a depth, three steps. Um, we also have been really fortunate to partner with Institute for Healthcare Quality, Safety, and Efficiency at University of Colorado to help build the teams doing this amazing kind of leadership and quality improvement safety program that kind of runs in parallel with the ADEPT program. So as we're building these kind of mechanics of a safety program, we're building the teams as well. So how do you build a coalition? How do you figure out the business case for safety? Those kind of things. So again, think about life skills for running a system as well as the research skills of figuring out the problem and solving it. Uh, you hear the participating sites. We have 14 across the country, a, a bunch of a couple of safety net hospitals, some non-university-based uh, teaching hospitals. So some great, great folks. I've been on kind of a national tour this year and seeing them all. It's been wonderful. Uh, but just give you a sense of where they all are. And just to kind of lay out the arc of what we're trying to do, we start off with these, the, a, a report uh, every day or every week, depends on how your hospital wants to do it, I forget how you're doing it here, of all the RRT calls, ICU transfers and deaths. We send a survey to the teams to say, hey, you know, hour back, what happened to that RT? Here's, give us a sense of what was going on. Well, what do you think could have improved? What do you think went well? We're trying to figure out what went well too, um, so that we can get understand what's happening. Because the problem with upside is always always the chart. We couldn't see what was going on people. So we, in people's emails or text messages, so like, tell us what you're doing. So survey plus the chart review you just saw. Then the two physicians and often the three are looking at each of those just to, to interpret the survey, interpret the chart and uh, basically generate the same data set we showed you before. We then take those data, like I mentioned, we are, I'll show you some formats and we send those up the chain, the CQO, at some places, sending it to the division chief, the departments. It depends on who is the, sees these data currently. And that's really the kind of the first use. And then we're, I'll share in a minute like how we're thinking about how to use these data to recalibrate AI models, because the AI needs supervision these days, you might have heard. Um, and then the benchmarking is about broad insights. So it's, there, I think there's a lot of local context and culture which comes into training programs. But when it comes down to like how to recognize sepsis, like that's, maybe not <laughs> negotiable. Like there, there's certain diseases we're seeing that like just are cross cutting. So we're trying to figure out how, what kind of pathophysiologies of diagnostic error we're seeing that are consistent across sites. Um, and it also helps us think about a generalized what diagnostic excellence program looks like. Like what should it look like? We all have ideas and kind of think about what that operation should look like. So we want at the end of ADAPT in two years to have sustainable programs at all these sites as well as others we're thinking about bringing on now. So, this is actual data. The uh, reason I was updating my slides this morning at 7.30, Megan, was because I was pulling this off our server. So we have a server that runs against our, our red cap data. So as we're entering chart data and it's finalized, we can pull it into this database. So uh, we have, not everyone here can log in, I'm sorry. Just the PIs that the sites can for now. But you get a dashboard of your site versus all. You can get plots. This is just the raw data. Um, so across the 1,500 or so cases we've done, 18% error rate, which is a little lower we saw of the de uh, upside, but close we think is a little lower because I think the RRTs have a slightly lower error rate. The RRT numbers are down below. Um, the harm ratings, I would say mostly look at the top two, the 54.8 and 13, uh, 15%. Um, we're wrestling a little bit more with this now than an upside because the RRT calls in themselves sometimes prompt additional monitoring. So I think a lot of that harm is not unreasonable, but just like, just because the patient didn't go to the ICU or die, this is a little crude, but like they had more time to have prolonged monitoring. So, but there's a lot, a lot that is monitoring and length of stay in that harm, which is not, un, not, not unimportant, just to give you a sense of what we're seeing. The process faults almost exactly the same as upside, right? We're seeing assessment, testing, a little more follow-up and monitoring. I think that, again, is probably representing the RRT thing. I think those of you who do staff RTs here as residents or 
So, so just if you do that, you, you get a sense that a lot of it is just people don't notice like the oxygen stats are the same, but the oxygen delivery is going up three, four, you know, that people just didn't recognize. So that kind of this, I think the theme we're seeing there's a little different um, than other that the previous study. But just if you look at the Pareto chart, like the what three things, four things get to 80% of your problems, it really comes down to assessment, testing, follow-up monitoring, and some physical exam issues. We're starting to look at POCUS here too, whether POCUS is helping. Next year, I'll tell you. Don't know yet. It's super interesting. As you, if you do POCUS here, like we do at UCSF, we do it a lot. We never document it, so it's hard to say. Uh, and then, unlike Upside, we're spending a lot of time trying because we can talk. We're getting survey data back from the providers. We actually can get a sense of what was going on in the system on the wards at the time. So we can give you. They, we're, they're giving us lots of sense of workload and staffing. And I think everyone, and I'll get to this later. Everyone feels like they're just at their limit. In terms of volume of cases they're seeing. This is that plus like, I was also doing admissions and got called with a cross cover. I couldn't quite get to see this patient. I would have liked to have seen them sooner. And then people are kind of brutally honest. I feel bad. They're like, they're really tough on themselves, but this is the kind of information we're getting back from the surveys. Some of these procedures and workflow, I think they're drilling down to a lot of how we do handoffs, but that's another way we're, we're a place we're seeing it. So again, the power of these data is that uh, as we're taking these up to our CQ and patient safety office at UCSF, our CQ is like, so what does that mean? Tell me what these, these fields mean and we can give her a story. So they seem to fit pretty neatly, maybe optimistic. I think it seems to be working here. Our team here has been amazing. Um, they seem to fit reasonably neatly into existing m and safety programs. Uh, we're starting to send all of our case reviews up into our instant reporting system now because they, they get kind of trusting the data. Uh, it is a lot of work to do this. Uh, it, that won't, thank you all who are doing this work at, uh, at Mount Sinai. It's a huge amount of work. Um, I hinted at this a minute ago. The physicians are really honestly able to reflect on their performance. We, as we're sending these surveys out, we suggest caring for their caregiver programs and that sort of stuff to make sure they feel safe, but they're just really tough. So almost to their detriment, they're tough on themselves, but I think physicians are tough on themselves uh, and reflecting on their performance honestly. And I think increasingly trusting in this process is key. So part of the conversation I have with the CQO is like, okay, so smart guy, where did these data come from? How can I trust they're valid? Because the minute I start giving these data to others, they're gonna ask me that same question. So having a team you can point to as your trusted colleagues part of a larger group that's been thinking about this for a long time has been super helpful for us at UCSF, and I think increasingly so across our network. The first opportunity though seems to be coming up, bubbling up is like giving feedback to providers, right? This is kind of the hope we all have. Like you, how many people review their cases after they rotate off service or after a night on call? Like that's, you kind of hope your best self is gonna do that, right? Uh, it's hard, uh, you're tired, you're like, you, you intentionally unplug from Epic for a day or two afterwards. Like, it's hard. It also just ends up feeling like this, right? If you're someone else is giving this to you and you're already kind of tired, you gotta be very careful about how you're giving feedback. It's a little different than feedback on like your, your golfing swing or whatever, right? Um, uh, they're the same, errors are the same in that systems are really part of it. A workload of stress, information technology, we'll talk about context and culture. Uh, you don't wanna make that the bailout, like, well, it's just cause I was up, you know, did, did the, the handoff was bad. Um, but they're different. I think the, the feedback, you immediately start to learn that this is about something going on in someone's head. Like sometimes it's knowledge gaps, but most often it's attention and kind of just missed it. Um, it's about reflection and adult learning. Uh, and then I think feedback from peers and coaches is gonna be really key, trusted providers. I'm not sure an AI chatbot is there yet, uh, but someone, again, I was gonna pull up Tibbs and put him on here, but I think Tibbs is a good, like he scares me. Like I think Joe Torre would be like a good coach. Like if someone like that, like if, if you could sit down with him and say, this is where you could have performed, performance could have improved is, is a good one. Um, the other thing we're observing is that machine learning AI is here. Like this is the computational AI, like uh, predictive algorithms, it's here. We're already using it. How many, I heard you have an early warning system already in place. We have sepsis ones, we don't have an early warning system at UCSF. Um, you can use that same approach to kind of screen charts very efficiently for ICD-10 codes, like that, that symptom diagnosis to kind of get a, an enriched trigger cohort, much more easily than you can do by chart. So, and there's already a, a methodology for that that was published a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and you could obviously use it prospectively to kind of poke people in the eye and remind them that they should be aware of a person who's decompensating. I think 
it always comes back to this issue though, particularly for computational AI. Um, it has a measurement problem, like the data we put into the EHR is ultimately flawed and noisy. So uh, I, we have to be, we're being careful about that as we think about how to design these. Um, for a debt, and for the stuff we're seeing in our ICU transfers, RRT calls and deaths, clearly getting a signal that like this whole idea of like patients just aren't responding the way we thought, or just not recognizing that decomposition is happening is a, is, is a, is a key arc of this. And there's, there's a lot of methodological questions about whether it's the slope of it or whether it changes abruptly. Let's just stop there for a minute. But like, so I get this alert, your patient is decompensating and it's not like a sepsis alert. What do we tell people to do then? Like if I get a sepsis alert, now it's like if you get the lactate fluids, antibiotics, right? If I get a, a decomposition where it's like, okay, think harder. And my answer is like, well, I thought I was thinking pretty hard, right? It's not like we aren't thinking. So like, what is that? What do you do? Um, and again, I'm always really humble because I've, I've, for my sins, I still govern, work in the governance community for UCSF's digital support. And like we have built a bazillion BPAs and they are uniformly ineffective. And if you look at the sepsis BPA literature, that's uniformly ineffective. And I think, so my friends who are data scientists are like, well, you know, I'm gonna make these models with C statistics of 0.95. And I say, well, great. If we go from 0.9 to 0.95, but we're only responding to them half the time, you haven't really won anything for me. So how are we gonna fix that problem? I'll flip the switches for a second, just talk about generative AI, because I think it's where most people's heads went when I said AI. But I wanna make the point that the kind of the analytic kind of uh, risk prediction model is one way. Generative AI is super hot, right? And it's, I love it. Uh, we were talking about um, this last night on, at dinner. Patients are using diagnosis finders. Physicians are using it. You saw the, the New England Journal paper last week. Uh, test interpretation is probably coming soon. Like, how do you interpret this combination of tests? Uh, Epic's building a bunch of different chart summary tools uh, that will help you kind of summarize the course of your patient to date. Those are all coming probably within six to 12 months at most places, right? They're just, it's just here. And then there's like, the, I put the dot, 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 because I don't know what, the, who knows what the kids are gonna think up next, right? So, but I, if you think about the app we're seeing in adept and upside, it, if you kind of drill down in errors and testing problems, it comes down to data acquisition and follow-up, right? So those are the lesions there and cognition problems. So the degree to which we can build GPT driven output that helps with those two things is gonna be a critical need. Again, another reason why I was doing these slides for 7.30 my this is an actual screenshot sent to me last night from a colleague at BI, Adam Rodman. So we took data from Upside and linked it to chart data, labs, orders, vital signs, and said, redo the nine domains of that underlying process faults from this chart. And, and we gave it a single pro shot prompt and a, a, a chain of thought prompt to get it through the nine domains. And this is what it gave us. It's a little weird. Right? There's some weirdness in there, but this, this feels like it's close, right? If you got this, you could say, well, this kind of prompts my think if you got this the next morning or after awards. So uh, this is kind of violates the rule of no preliminary data. I just, this is very preliminary, but giving you a sense of like, you could almost do this now. So this is what you're thinking about generative AI in a, in a reasonably safe way. And, and one of the models for us going forward is giving this to our depth teams and have the adept teams calibrate these, correct these so the models get better. But just to return to the clinical decision support, the BPA model. So I think this is support, you think of alerts, reminders, and prompt systems, all those things that pop up and ask you to cancel out, or you cancel out, they ask you not to. Uh, remind you there's a lot of the decision support in the electronic health record, how you design your documents, your data presentation, you can talk about this here. So AI could be woven into all of those uh, to think about, again, cognition and workflow problems. The challenge then becomes, it kind of gets us back where we are now with Epic, right? It's a complicated place. And this is a slide from Harvard Business Review, maybe 10 years ago, that talks about how Ford um, had to, this challenge of going from the Model T to building a bunch of new models, went from this really low cost Model T, which is very simple, had a very standard set of things, to a lot of customization. Uh, and if anybody's looked at Epic recently, knows kind of where we are on the, cust on the Epic. So, um, you know, physicians really want this, right? We want, like we've emphasized customizing Epic, all the things you can wrench in, all the different data views. Like I just joke, the great thing about Epic is you do 12 things 100 different ways. That's also the worst thing about Epic. 
Uh, I think the future is probably gonna need this, right, to make things work better. So the issue, the opportunity here though, is that you get lower cognitive load, right? The reason we don't do this now is because it just takes a lot of work to, to drill out all these things, but it also gets to a place where you have a much simpler cockpit we jump, jump into. Um, but again, at the other end, uh, you have higher autonomy, like the thing we value to this point with the EHR governance and decision supports, having, giving physicians the autonomy to do what they think they need to do at the time. And also, quite frankly, you don't have to train people. You just kind of say, well, here's, here's Epic, here's a bunch of regging tools, have at it, right? Again, that's been a reasonable way to go, but I think we're at the point now, certainly we're seeing like this idea of cognition surfacing data is just a really, really important problem to start to wrestle with, particularly as we're starting to think about chucking more alerts and decision support into people's workflow. Um, this is from a uh, our, uh, report we had out a couple months ago. Michelle Nees at, at Colorado wrote this. Just to give you a sense of there's two different kinds of, there's a bunch of different kinds of cognitive load, but the one you should keep in your mind is germane load. This is the doctor brain load. This is the, 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 the uh, cognitive work you put to the germane task, right? Which you, with, or the threats to germane load are uh, intrinsic load. So that's like how you get through the system. So how you get through Epic, also how you get through your day. And then uh, you, extrinsic load, which is like, how do you find the data in the system? So that's, if you, if you think about those, those two types of loads, you can, you start to think about how to redesign your system. You wanna make the system as simple as possible, surface the data as easily as you can, and um, make it uh, pretty standard and straightforward. So I'll use an analogy, this may not work for you, it works for me. This is like a picture of my toolbox right now. That's why I have like seven different Phillips head screwdrivers and two hammers and I can't find them any, anywhere, right? I'm always going to Home Depot to get new ones. I can't find the old ones. If that feels like your epic experience, like kind of that's the same thing, right? It's this messy toolbox, right? So one way to get at this is this, this sick person has this toolbox, God bless them, but like this is not me, but like this, like this is what we might want to think about. It's still pretty complicated, right? Lots of choices, but they're all in the same place every time. It's kind of like the airplane cockpit model. I think people think a lot about like, well, just tell me the one thing I should use in this toolbox, which is a different risk, right? Because if you get that guess wrong, so this, the tension between this middle one and the right-hand one is kind of where I think decision support and AI need to think about, like what is the tension there of giving the, all the options versus the right one or two? The other way people have thought about AI is like self-driving cars, right? This is an actual Waymo car in San Francisco. We, yeah, you don't have them here, thank you. You're lucky because they're all the place in San Francisco. But this is like, you get in a cab, they literally drive you where you want to go, there's no human involved. So that future people think about as the goal of AI. Uh, but I'll use an example that's probably more recognizable to you because it's probably about 20 of them just rode by Mount Sinai a minute ago is the electric bike, right? So maybe you don't need a, a, a car that drives you where you need to go, but just one that helps you get there more easily with less effort so you can spend more time on the work you need to do. So neater toolbox, the better kind of presentation of tools and a boost for you to get where you need to go, I think is the way to think about AI for the next couple of years. So again, hot off the press, this, like if you Google up physician burnout, this is the list of things that come up on Google. So I wanna mention this for a minute. This is worth a talk in itself, right? So all this is happening in a time of physician burnout, like we're like happy it's not 50, it's like less than 50% right now. Like that's a win. It doesn't feel like a win to me, right? So like the, all this is happening in a very important context. So thinking about how the system needs to be redesigned separate from the computers is really important. Um, and certainly something that is uh, serves as an adept. So you can't AI your way out of this, right? You can't, this is not AI available. So this is a quote from someone I, uh, at an AI conference of that last week. Um, the way we're trying to get around this now with ADEPT is to really think about a just culture mindset. We want people to you know, feel safe with this feedback, but they have to take some ownership, right? Because they're gonna get better. So what does that just culture look like? Uh, I talked about honesty and integrity in the process. Like your colleagues did this work to make you a better doctor. The, the idea of beneficence in this whole thing is kind of something we're trying to like, really be clear about. Like this isn't just us like, you know, trying to, do gotchas. This is about trying to make my colleagues and myself better. Uh, and I think it's hard because I think the, the rock, to move this rock of do work and workload up the hill is really hard. But like thinking about reorganizing the work is not just making the workers better is a key part we're thinking about. Again, trying not to ex exclude the context of, uh, of what we're thinking about uh, in the work workplace. 
All right, so some conclusions. Um, so diagnostic errors are clearly common and harmful. I think our work in upside surface that it's really not less common in a depth, uh, even 1,400, 1,500 cases in. Um, I think the processes we're seeing are mostly cognitive. You think about the assessment and the testing, like the problem with not choosing the test is actually probably a cognitive one as well. So thinking about the cognitive work we're doing is really going to be important. How we get to that is going to be, I'll give you some hints. Uh, AI is here, but I, again, the optimal use isn't quite clear yet. But I'm deeply optimistic. I think I talked to Andy last night. I think this is probably not a two to three year thing. It's probably more like a six to 12 months thing for some of these models. So um, being careful about how we deploy it, uh, thoughtful, integrating to existing programs so we can kind of understand how it works is going to be really important going forward. And again, I, I, I feel like I've said this 20 times, but just redesigning the work is going to be super important in the EHR, outside the EHR, it's just going to be really a key part of what we do. You know, it's always a little dangerous to end a talk by throwing a bucket of cold water on things. But I want to just kind of end with a kind of a, a framing thought about the field of diagnostic safety in, in uh, safety in general. So you probably saw this paper from David Bates last fall, where he basically repeated the Harvard Medical Practice Study. And he saw a, basically the same error rate that he saw 30 years ago. Pretty depressing. And a lot of reasons for that. I think the patients are different now. He's a slightly different methodology. You know, the, lots, the patients are a lot sicker. Um, you know, but it's kind of the same numbers and people were just crushed. I was, I'm still pretty sad about this. And I think there are a lot of reasons for this. I think, and a lot of systems have changed. But I think um, uh, Don Borwick, as he always does, had this really great editorial that went with it. And I think uh, the last paragraph here is the important one. It, it, they may not welcome, hospitals may not welcome the need to push patient safety back to strategic prominence, but first do no harm. In the case of diagnostic errors, not only to our patients, but also to our providers, is a sacred obligation, uh, and the constancy of purpose for improvement is going to be key. So I think things are going to be different this time. I think, uh, and I'm, I think the, there are a variety of things that we're working on upside, there are other people around the country at Adept that are, uh, are working on similar things, but I think unlike med errors, which were not unimportant. I think diagnostics are really core to what make doctors want to be doctors. No one goes into this be like not good at this. So um, making people better, I think, is a, a, a leg up for us. Uh, I think the value and importance of the workforce is increasingly well recognized. I think that is going to make things easier for us. Patients are becoming active partners. The day when you walk into a patient's room and they give you the differential and you have to negotiate to talk about why that how you agree or not is like probably again it's probably six to twelve months away. So patients can be really active partners in this in a way that it was just harder for them to be active partners in the med air world. And I think technology is close. Like is it's going to be both an opportunity to scale understanding the problem and provide solutions in a way that just wasn't uh, feasible in the past. Great, so I'm gonna finish now. Thank you for inviting me and have a few minutes for, for questions. Thank you, Andy, that was masterful. Thanks so much. Uh, we, and, uh, our group here has been really thrilled to work with you in the National Consortium on Adept and others, and Linker and WNA and others. It's been wonderful experience for us. We, we drink the Kool-Aid on improving diagnostic errors. So two, two comments about AI. You know, one is, I think a lot of us are worried that we might recreate the errors of BPAs in the, in the electronic medical record when we hit with this overwhelming amount of suggestions, much of which ends up being irrelevant, so you have to sift out what's really important. So any suggestions I'm getting there? And the other is that AI and machine learning by necessity is very black box relative to a specific site and purpose, and it's actually make it harder to sort of scale that out more easily. Yeah. So uh, is it okay if I have Annie and Avina and others of the adept team kind of raise their hands so they can get recognized? There they are. There they are. They're your, they're your champions. That also made me forget the questions, Annie. No, I'm kidding. Um, so I'll do the second one first. AI is definitely a black box. LLMs probably feel like less of a black box. They feel conversational, but you still, you kind of, like that, that screenshot I sent you, you kind of scratch the surface. It feels a little, not hallucinating, but it feels a little weird. Like some of the language is a little weird. So. I think it's going to be, there's going to be a filter between us AI people 
and the end users for a while. Um, uh, and what was the first question, Andy, again? Whether we're going to recreate the power of the EAs. So uh, that guy's going to, I probably didn't nail that well enough, but that's that, my biggest concern here. Like, you know, where, how do you insert this information into someone's already busy workflow is not clear. And, you know, the, this, uh, uh, we have just built a brand new BPA for, on, based on machine learning, but using the same, for sepsis, but, uh, but it's the same BPA, basically, same workflow. So I'm not sure. We may find out if the machine learning is the, what fix, fixes the problem, but I think we'd be a lot more thoughtful about it. Um, you know, there's a story, uh, I heard this meeting in, in San Diego a week or so ago on AI, uh, that they told about GM in the late 90s, I want to say it was, and they were trying to compete more with the Japanese car firms who were very heavily roboticized. Roboticized? At the time, they said, is that the right word? Um, said, I'm not, that was like human-driven uh, assembly lines in GM. They said, well, we have to like, have robots start doing this stuff. So they built a bunch of robots, and at the end, the robots were put in, and they couldn't build a car because they hadn't standardized their workflows well enough. And the workflows are still too driven by human complexity to make the robots be effective. And I think that's what we have to do with EHR and some of our work in the hospital. Certainly, EHR just strip out as much as we can. Uh, what that looks like, I don't know yet, but I think you know, that, that is probably a precondition even to get better DPAs because you can't pay attention to math. Yeah. Just as a formal to follow up on what Andy said, um, what are the strategies that is used to that could be used is to have another human in the loop because AI is still not perfect. For example, uh, during that boot camp for the new system, um, the way that is designed is that the alerts for the decompensation they are not often actionable or specific, so those alerts go out to a central hospital. So when then do a chart release? Know, understand the context and send a secure chat to the team. So there is, so the end users are not directly exposed to all the wrong information. Right. That could that require more investment, but uh, that could be a stopgap. I, I want to hear that. So instead of the BPA going to Neon Service, there's like a, a clearinghouse. There was a paper from Tim Judson and Bob Walker this idea the taco, the trans, basically applying consults at a distance to someone in our hospital. It's a diabetes specialist reviews all the blood sugars and insulin flow sheets overnight. And anybody who triggers, he gives you an e-consult. So you don't get the BPA on how you should fix the Lantus or whatever. He gives you an email or a box message. And it actually turns out you can bill for it too. So there's a win-win there. But so I, I agree. Um, for diagnostic safety, there's a few things that are emerging, and I, I think they, they, it's going to require some thought. This idea of a diagnostic timeout. You guys all heard this. So we started to flip this idea a couple weeks ago and people were like, I don't have time already. You're telling me to take a timeout. So that I think is challenge number one. Like if you don't have time, how do you take a timeout? But a, uh, a second, there's a lot of interest in second opinions. It's more, I think it's easier to envision this happening in the outpatient setting where you can screen through chart, charts of patients who have kind of, kind of undifferentiated symptoms. Uh, just because you have more time maybe. In the hospital, we have to think about how that works, but this, that's the idea. There's a LLM or AI model that spits out a bunch of cases of patients who look like they are maybe are falling off some expected diagnosis curve, and you get an expert over here. And then the science of that, art, the science of that is easy-ish. It's the art then becomes who does that, and that's where I think Joe Torre or someone like Joe Torre or I don't, your, whoever your, your master clinicians are can give you coaching to do. Good question. Alrighty, nothing else. Let's thank our speaker for a great talk.